nature not, I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case, open and shut No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut Today we'll go bird watching, tomorrow we'll catch toads The next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut Well, I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things And I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case Open and shut No doubt about it I'm a nature nut When winter blows its frosty breath across the snowbound lot, those chirpy birds come by in droves to poke around somewhat. Feeders filled with the finest seeds see to it the birds are well fed, while all around them winter rages and snow piles up on their head. They have, mind you, I must confess, a thing or two to learn about befitting etiquette. They dine quite unconcerned. Half the food they gladly eat, the rest they throw around. With flailing bills and shuffling feet, they dump it on the ground. That stuff's expensive, I exclaim. But blankly back they stare. It's me, I think, who is to blame to think that they should care. Come spring, the fat and happy birds will migrate like they've done before. Next winter, they will all return. Mess up my yard once more. See that? A blue jay. But you know the joys of winter bird watching go far beyond what you can see out the kitchen window at the bird feeder. After all, winter birds are the easiest animals to find outdoors because everything else is either hibernating, hiding in the woods, or they've migrated to warmer places further south. But speaking of hibernation, come and have a look what I've got here next to the peanut butter. These are fire-bellied toads, and they spend about three weeks every winter in my refrigerator. On damp sphagnum moss. Oh, stay in there, guys. It may seem strange to you to have toads in the refrigerator, but it's actually it's not too hard on the toads. My wife's a doctor. She doesn't worry about to having toads in the refrigerator. She doesn't like it, but she doesn't worry about it. As long as you don't confuse them with the cookie jar, everybody will be okay. I'll put the lid back on so they can go back to sleep. And that's not all I've got in the fridge. Have a look at this. I'm very excited about it. This is a praying mantis egg case. Inside this little brown foamy thing, there are praying mantis eggs. And in a couple of weeks, hundreds of baby mantises are going to come streaming out. But not all my animals spend their winter vacation in the fridge. I've got some more in the nature nook. In this terrarium, a white tree frog, a tropical frog that doesn't need to hibernate. Where it comes from, there is no winter. More tropical amphibians here. And here, my favorite animals, my leopard geckos. Right now, they're ignoring each other. But as soon as the days get a bit longer, they'll start courting and mating. And I'm hoping this year, they'll lay some eggs. Come here, Bluey. This is Bluey Louie, isn't that a lovely name? And she's a leopard gecko. You know, lizards, geckos are kind of a lizard. Lizards remind many people of dinosaurs. But we now know, by the miracle of science, that dinosaurs are actually much closer related to birds. In fact, birds are nothing more or less than a particular sort of dinosaur that has evolved feathers and the ability to fly. So when we go bird watching, we're actually going dinosaur watching. Birds have been around for 160 million years, since the middle of the age of dinosaurs. Let's start out by admitting the obvious. You know it, I know it. The reason a lot of people don't want to become bird watchers is because they're afraid of looking like a dweeb. A real dweeb. Hello. Have you made any interesting ornithological field sightings today? And what about those male models in winter catalogs? Don't they know what to do with their hands? They're always holding binoculars. You 
know, you can't really watch birds this way. As soon as you hold the binoculars up to your face, it looks like a dweeb again. The solution, of course, is simply to dress sensibly, dress warm, and I think you'll find once you get out bird watching in the winter that you will not be alone. In fact, bird watching is now just about as popular as fishing. Look at these boots. You can't possibly get cold and stuff like this. It's just about as popular as fishing. So you get out there on the trail, warm gloves, warm hat. This, uh, you know, hat band kind of thing is good too. And binoculars will be ready to go bird watching. Let's do it. Hey, have a look at this. The bark has been chipped off this old dead spruce tree. That's a sure sign of three-toed woodpeckers. Look at it, it's all over the ground here. This is gonna be a good place to look for birds, but you know, just about any place is good if you're just starting out with bird watching, but if, you're, if you wanna to go to the best spots, if you wanna know where the very best bird watching places are in your area, make sure to ask at I don't know, a nature center or a bird watching store, a local Audubon Society or a naturalist club. They'll know the best spots. But for now, let's have another look around here. Okay, we've got some birds in the bush here. And red spots on the foreheads. Red spots on the forehead, little birds. Red poles, common red poles. I say, oh, now they're gone too. You know, when you're watching birds, you gotta be fast. They don't just stick around letting you watch them as long as you want. It's not like watching birds on television or in bird books. Pileated woodpecker just disappeared behind the trees. Unbelievable. The birds are here, but you gotta spot them quick. Most insect-eating birds migrate south in the winter. Some woodpeckers are an exception. <laughs> oh no, I drew the tree too small. I've just been drawing a sketch of this female downy woodpecker. She's moving up the tree. I enjoy drawing birds, but I'm never going to make my living at it. If you find that it's hard to remember all the field marks in the field guide, you know, the eye lines, the wing bars, the tail stripes, try drawing a picture of the bird you're looking at, and by the time you've finished drawing it, even if the drawing isn't any good, you'll certainly know the bird better than you did beforehand, even if you got a good look at it in your binoculars. There are thousands of books in the Bird Watcher's Library. Choosing the right one can be a tricky thing indeed. You need binoculars to watch birds, but you also need a field guide, a book that will tell you which birds are which birds. Sometimes it's easy. If you live in the West Indies, all you need is The Birds of the West Indies by James Bond. This James Bond was the inspiration for Ian Fleming's James Bond, the spy. These guys were not dweebs. But let me tell you about a couple other books. Here's a good one, The Golden Field Guide to the Identification of Birds of North America. Easy to read upside down and not a bad book, very user friendly. This is my favorite, Peterson's Field Guide to the Western Birds. There's also an Eastern Field Guide. This is a good one because every picture plate has little arrows that show you what to look for to tell what kind of bird you're looking at. Handy, written by Roger Torrey Peterson, the great man of bird watching. Or if you want the authoritative tome on uh, bird identification in North America, this is the natural Ge National Geographic, not Natural Geographic, I don't know what that means. National Geographic Field Guide to North American Birds. Excellent book, a little more detailed than you might need if you're just starting out with bird watching. 
Speaking of which, there are, only, there are about 600 species of birds in North America. That's a lot of birds. That's why this is my favorite book for beginning bird watches. It's called the Peterson First Guide to uh, something or other, uh, birds. Yes, birds. And uh, it's a great little book. It only shows you the common birds, so you won't find every bird that you see in this book. But on the other hand, most of the birds you see will be in this book. It's also a very small and thin book, and it's easy to hide if you don't want anybody to know that you're a bird watcher. But why would you want that? After all, if you have a book in your pocket that has a bird on it, they'll know that you're spying on birds, not them, those people who are wondering. Okay, so we're out. We've got a good spot to start bird watching, but what do we do? Well, one thing you can do is you can try pishing and squeaking in the woods. What the heck is pishing, you ask? It goes like this. Pshhh. You make that noise, and for some reason, birds are interested in what it might be. You can, uh, you can do it sort of like uh, psh, 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 psh. or you can uh, stretch it out. Psh. You can do it uh, really softly, psh, 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 psh. or you can make it as loud as you want. Birds, uh, you gotta try different things to see what the birds like that uh, in that particular day, in that particular place. I don't know who the idiot was who named it pishing, but uh, obviously someone who wasn't concerned about looking like a dweeb uh, while being a bird watcher. But if you don't want to do uh, pishing right off the bat, if that's a bit much for you, you can always try squeaking. Here's a little mechanical squeaker. And it's a red piece of metal with a, with a, or pardon me, it's a metal looking piece of metal with a red piece of wood stuck to it. And you just turn it and it makes a squeaking noise. And birds find squeaking noises really interesting as well. Or you can make your own squeaking noise by kissing your hand. Like that. It's kind of the sound, you know, that an old lady relative makes when she kisses you at Christmas on the cheek, right by your ear. Birds are curious about these things. I don't know why. Okay, this looks like a good spot to try some pishing and squeaking. I'm gonna give it a go. We'll see if any birds come to investigate. If you're feeling a bit self-conscious about making these noises in the woods, there are various ways you can do it more discreetly while still attracting the birds. You can wear a scarf. Be a tree. Birding means the same as bird watching, but birding is a much more serious term. Okay, this is how it happens. You never see just one bird at a time. You always see them all at once. Up in the top of that spruce tree, a flock of birds, small gray birds, little crests on the tops of their heads. That means waxwings. And in wintertime, the common species of waxwing is bohemian waxwing. And I also hear, ooh, there he is. I heard his little tapping and his scratching of his toenails. Look at that, that's a, um, it looks like a little, it sounds like a little woodpecker and it looks like a little chickadee, but it's upside down on the bark and that can only mean one thing. It's a nuthatch. Around here, there's two kinds of nuthatches though. So we need the field guide. One moment. Nut hatches. After a while, you get to find these things fairly quickly in your field guide, but uh, here's the situation. Could be the white-breasted nuthatch, or it could be the red-breasted nuthatch. 
but as you probably have noticed, it's hard to see the color of that little critter's breast. The easier thing to look for is whether it has a white line through the eye or whether it just has a white face with a dark head. You guessed it, white line through the eye, that means red-breasted nuthatch pecking at a knot hole. It's turning out to be not a bad day for birds. After all, we're finding quite a few different species, aren't we? She was the best 360 species on her life list up till now The Clark's Nutcracker would be next That much she did vow Well, she sold her house and her antique clock And she took off on a quest Into the western mountains Blissfully obsessed From B.C. and Alberta on down to Mexico Wherever the Clarks were cracking nuts That's where she'd go Well, her trusty binoculars Were always close at hand She bought a second-hand telescope Down by the Rio Grande The Clarks nutcrackers field marks And their calls she knew by heart it seemed that only lousy luck was keeping on them apart. Oh, burn, burn, watch your bitty. Then one day in Banff, Alberta, up close to Lake Louise, Betty pshed and Betty squeaked until Betty wheezed. And through the pines there came a bird, it flew right overhead. And Betty, the bird watcher, she nearly fell down dead. Mm, well, bird watcher Betty was a cut above the rest, an absolute fanatic. She was the best. 361 species on her life list up till now. She found the clerk's nutcracker as only as she knew how. Burn, watch your Betty. She found the clerk's nutcracker as only as she knew. Watch your bitty. Okay, what about binoculars? You need a pair of binoculars or you really can't do bird watching the right way. But how do you know which kind of binoculars to get? Well, it's a complex subject. There are a lot of different kinds of binoculars. Let me give you a quick rundown on the different types of pairs of binoculars. By the way, why do you call this a pair of binoculars? There's only one. Some people call it a binocular, but most of us call it a pair of binoculars. It's kind of like a pair of pants, I guess, because you got two legs, or a pair of socks because you got two feet. I got two arms. I don't call it a pair of shirts. So why do we call it a pair of binoculars? Any of you have four eyes? If so, you'll make the best bird watchers of all. Sorry, I got distracted. These are compact binoculars. Lightweight, easy to carry. Some of them are really good quality. But some of them, a lot of them, give you a slightly dark image that doesn't have as much detail in every feather as you might like. If you're the kind of person who likes to look at a bird feather by feather, which is, of course, the best way to look at a bird, if you've got the time. This is the best overall design, in my opinion. The Poro Prism Binocular. What does that mean, Poro Prisms? Well, there are some prisms in there, which are apparently very poro. I don't know what that word poro means, but I can tell you that the light comes in here, bounces around a bit, and comes 
out this lens here so that these lenses that you look through are much closer together than the lenses down here that look at the bird. And these are poro prism binoculars as well. They weigh about 50 pounds and they're intended for looking at stars and the moon and things like that. You mount them on a tripod, no good for bird watching, unless of course you want to carry a big tripod around and look like a dweeb. The very best binoculars, roof prism binoculars. Roof prism binoculars have prisms in them as well, but the prisms are very roof. The lenses at the front are about the same distance apart as the lenses that you look through. And, oh, these are nice binoculars. These aren't mine. I had to borrow them. They're worth about $1,000. They've got nitrogen gas inside. They're waterproof. <laughs> Boy, nice binoculars. If you've got a pair of these, nice going. How about for kids? Most binoculars are too powerful for kids. They can't find things with them. You need a nice low power pair of binoculars like this. Good color too. Uh, this is a four power pair of binoculars. Easy to hold steady, nice lightweight. Kids love them. I love them too. What do you mean, John? Low power binoculars. Well, every pair of binoculars has two numbers on it. This one says seven by 26. What does that mean? The seven has to do with the magnification power of the binoculars. It makes things look seven times bigger. The 26, well, that's the diameter of this lens and this lens in millimeters. A bigger lens, more light, a brighter picture. So it's up to you, whatever binoculars you buy. Everybody thinks their pair of binoculars is the best. Bird watchers love to argue about it. It's a social thing. Does this ever happen to you? You're out bird watching, you see a bird, you get your binoculars, and all you can see is branches through the binoculars? Well, here's how the seasoned, avid bird watchers do it. Keep your eye on the bird, bring your binoculars up, and just pop them into place. You should get the bird that way. Or look for an obvious landmark, like a big tree trunk or a blob of snow in the branches. Find that first, and then find the bird from there. If you still can't find the bird, probably flew away. When winter arrives, about two-thirds of the summer bird species fly south. Well, that brings us to the end of our winter bird watching expedition. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. So until next time, I'm a nature nut, and I hope you are too. You ever wonder what an acorn's doing up a maple tree? While you're thinking about that, I'm going to leave you to watch some of my own home bird videos. Happy bird watching. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.